the people walking in darkness. Have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness. A light has dawned. When Joe retired from the Navy after 20 years of service, he realized that he still wanted to serve his community in some way, shape, or form. He was stationed down in San Diego. And so being in San Diego County, he realized also that the San Diego County Sheriff was hiring and he wanted to be a deputy. He put in all of his paperwork and sure enough, he got uh, hired by the department. He went through all the training and soon after, he was on patrol daily. Joe's one of my best friends in the world. He and I text each other daily and pray for each other daily. And I remember when he was going through that whole discernment process and how happy we were for him when he was able to become a deputy. I, I asked Joe a couple years after that, I said, hey, do you have any regrets about stepping into law enforcement? He said, absolutely none. And I said, Joe, we've got shared mud and blood together, man. You've seen some of the worst the world has to offer, and you're seeing a lot of it as a deputy. What's been your greatest reward? And what he said was typical of Joe. I actually wrote it down. He said, I've had several people I've arrested and who've gone to prison who, after they get out, they seek me out to thank me for treating them with dignity and respect. Listen to this. He said, part of my job as a deputy is to be a little bit of light and a lot of darkness. That little bit of light can change a life. Have you ever considered that a little bit of light can expel the darkness but also, have you ever considered that an explosion of light can completely destroy the darkness? Such is what we're going to talk about today. If you get anything at all out of today's teaching, get this. Jesus is the light that expels the darkness as well as your darkness. Jesus is the light. He's the light of the world that expels the darkness. We're talking the principalities of darkness. We're talking about darkness in the unseen realm as well as your darkness and my darkness, because face it, we all have darkness and brokenness in our lives. Well, God's got a lot to say about that as we wrap up our Christmas series called All is Bright. In the first two weeks of this series, Pastor Bob really hit on this main point. The first week, he talked about Jesus stepping down from his throne, being born in a manger, and then bringing light into the darkness. Last week, he gave us a great challenge, and that challenge was for all of us because we are blessed to be a blessing. Well, I'm excited about this week because this week I'm preaching on a not-so-traditional Christmas story. In fact, it's not a Christmas story at all. It's a very familiar story called The Woman at the Well. It's about a Samaritan woman, and I think at the end of today's teaching, you're going to see why I chose it specifically for this series because she's a, an, a great example of why Jesus came. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So we're going to be hanging out in John chapter 4, verses 3 through 42. Uh, freak not, we're not going to go through every one of those verses, but we are going to do a mostly verse by verse. So turn to John chapter 4. Let me set the scene for what's happening. Our story picks up in the first year of Jesus' ministry about 2,000 years ago. Jesus is in Jerusalem, and he decides that he needs to go north to Galilee. Now, to go north to Galilee was a big deal. We don't know if he got invited up there. We don't know if he'd been sparring a little bit with the Pharisees, the, the leaders of the Judean Jews. We don't know if that was what was happening. We simply don't know. We do know this is he had to go north, and to go north, he was going to take the direct route. And that would freak anyone out who was a Jewish person, a Jewish man, but specifically a Jewish rabbi, because he was going to go shoot straight through Samaria. Now, if you go through Samaria, it's about a three-day trip to Galilee, but others would not do that. They would actually skirt around Samaria, so it's a five- to seven-day trip. He's like, nope, I got a mission. And so they go on mission to Samaria. We're going to talk about why that's such a goofy thing in just a couple of minutes. But the bottom line is this. 
We've got a key verse for our series. That key verse is Isaiah 9, verse 2. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. And what we're going to see out of today's teaching is Jesus shining a light on the Samaritan people. He's going to see, we're going to see him shine the light on the Samaritan Jewish woman. And last but not least, he's going to shine the light on the disciples and us. So I'm excited about today's teaching. Three theologians I leaned into for our teaching today, uh, Timothy Keller, Michael Heiser, and then Eli Eisenberg. We're going to get a different twist to some of this story. I hope you enjoy it. Strap in because God's going to show us some pretty cool stuff. Remember our main thought, Jesus is the light that expels the darkness as well as your darkness and my darkness. John 4, verses 3 and 4. Here we go. He, Jesus left Judea and went away again into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. He had to pass through Samaria. Now, we don't know why he, he had to pass, but we can take some, some good guesses. Jesus always did things for a reason and a purpose. Jesus would always say that he and the Father are one, so I think it's safe to say that God the Father was in agreement that Jesus needed to go to Samaria because he had a mission. But there's hatred between the Judean Jews, and the Samaritans, and the Samaritan Jews. So let's talk about that. To understand that, we got to go back a thousand years before this story. David is king of all of Israel. You know David from David and Goliath fame. David's the king of all of Israel. Uh, God uses David to unite Israel. Things go well. He leads for 40 years. He dies. His son Solomon takes over. Solomon leads again for about 40 years. He dies, and then there's civil war in all of Israel. Israel splits 10 tribes to the north, two tribes to the south. Uh, the two tribes to the south are, are really referred to as Judah. So when I refer to the Judean Jews, the, it's the, the people of Judah. Jesus is part of the Judean Jews, okay? The 10 tribes to the north, now these guys had a, a difficult time. They failed to follow God. In fact, they would allow pagan worship. They would, uh, about 700 years before uh, Jesus, they would be invaded by the Assyrians. They would blend Judaism with all all these other different nations, little G gods, and they would be looked upon as they inbred with those foreign powers. They would be looked upon from the Judean Jews as half breeds. They would be looked upon as heretics, but here's the deal. The Samaritan Jews, and we forget the Samaritans were Jewish people. The Samaritan Jews felt that they were the true sons of the covenant, that they were true sons of the Jewish faith, the keepers of the faith. And they had a fourfold creed. The Samaritan Jews fourfold creed. First thing is one God, that's Yahweh. Secondly, one prophet, Moses. They, they felt that Moses was not only the most important prophet, but the prophet. Third thing, one book, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They didn't, they don't, they didn't consider anything of the Hebrew Bible besides the Torah. And then last but not least, one place, one place to worship, Mount Gerizim, now, the Judean Jews, where Jesus comes from, uh, 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 who Jesus would hail from, because he would come from that line of Judah, they'd push hard against that. Yes, one God, Yahweh, got it. One prophet, yeah, Moses was a very prominent prophet and the most important prophet in the Jewish faith, but there were other prophets, and we're going to see that play out in our story today. The whole concept of one book, the Torah, well, the Judean Jews believed in the Psalms, in fact, all of those different minor prophets, they felt that you couldn't understand who the Messiah would be without those. And last but not least, least one place, Mount Gerizim? No, it's Jerusalem, Mount Zion. So you can see there's religious tension. It's kind of like with uh, the Islamic faith today. You've got Shia and Sunni, and they're never going to come together. The same is true with the Samaritan Jews and the Judean Jews. Let's keep on going, verses 5 and 6. So he, Jesus, came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. Okay, hold on just a second. Jacob's well is where the Samaritan woman and Jesus are going to have this convo. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. The sixth hour is noon. We, we may or may not have time to dig into that. So they're in Sychar. Sychar is in the region of Shechem. So just as Bellingham 
is in Whatcom County. So Sychar is in Shechem, the region of Shechem, and that's important. And for those of you who were here for our last series, Pastor Bob and I preached a lot about the importance of Shechem. You may remember that the word Shechem in Hebrew means shoulder, that God would shoulder their burdens. You, you may remember that Shechem, when it was a city, now it's a larger region, Shechem was one of six cities of refuge. So if you killed someone and the, the avenger was coming after you, you could go to the city for safety. But beyond that, Shechem was the place where God first appeared to Abraham and said, I'm giving you all this promised land. It was a place where Jacob, Abraham's grandson, would lay down his roots. In fact, what Jacob would do is he'd dig a really deep well, and that's where this conversation's occurring. But also, Shechem is the place of Mount Gerizim. Remember that fourfold creed, one place, Mount Gerizim? And then last but not least, Shechem is where Joseph's bones are buried. So what? You're going to see at the end of this teaching how that all comes together because Jesus is on a mission. He always did things with a purpose. There's a reason he chose this specific ground for this specific conversation. So disciples go out and get some food. Jesus is sitting at the well. It's noon and this lady approaches by herself and he simply says, I'm thirsty. Give me a drink. Skip down to verse 9. Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you being a Jew, a Judean Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, Jesus' accent probably gave him away. If uh, you're from Galilee or from Nazareth, it's kind of like if somebody showed up here and they had been born and raised in Brooklyn, you know, how you doing? Are you looking at me? How you doing? You know that they weren't from Bellingham. Well, the same is true here. Jesus' accent gave him away, and probably he had some form of things on his clothing that showed that he was a rabbi in some way, shape, or form. Now, remember, the Judean Jews and the Samaritans are bitter enemies. Both, both of them consider each other to be imposters of the faith. But here's what Jesus does is he crosses barriers. He did it 2,000 years ago. He does, he does it today. Jesus reaches across every barrier to bring light into the darkness. So there are four main barriers that he's crossing right here. There's a racial barrier because the Samaritans were viewed as half-breeds, an inferior race. There's a moral barrier. They were looked at as pagans. Obviously, there's a gender barrier because we're talking, Jesus is talking to a woman. And then last but not least, there's a religious barrier, the whole concept of a heretic. But Jesus did it then and he does it today. Let's keep on going. Verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked, and he would have given you living water. Now, we know what the living water is. We've got the Bible. We've, we know the end of the story, that, that, that Jesus is going to pour out his Holy Spirit, and, and with him, we can always be, uh, be quenched for, for our thirsts, that, that we can always go to his well for that abundant life. She doesn't know that. She has no clue what he's talking about. So here's what she's going to do. With the oral tradition, she knows the Torah. And so she decides that she's going to spar with the maker of heaven and earth. So round one begins. Here we go. Uh, she brings up these religious differences. Look at verses 12 through 14. She says, you're not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well, drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle, Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Jesus is saying, drink from my well. Drink from my well and you'll have life. Without me, you'll perish. I love how one pastor put this when he paraphrased it. In essence, Jesus says these words to her. He says, what I have for you, acceptance, grace, love, and a purpose, what I have for you is just as necessary for you spiritually as water is for you physically. You can't experience life without it. You can't experience life without me. If I'm not the one you're living for, everything will fail you and you'll die of thirst. Jesus is talking spiritual things. She's like, oops, okay, didn't win that round. So she takes a different approach. 
she's going to get very, very practical now. She basically says, tell me where I can get this water so I don't have to keep lugging this jug up the hill. Jesus won't allow the redirect because he has to enter her darkness. Pay attention to these next few verses because they're so important, not only in our story or this story, but our story. Verses 16 through 18. He said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you've correctly said, I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you've said truly. Whenever we interpret scripture, we need to start with, with, with what the text says, the literal translation. Here's what the text says. We get the meaning from that, and then you can look at the historical context, the cultural context, maybe there's metaphor or allegory, whatever, but this, you just got to start with the literal text. And what the text says are two facts. She's had five husbands, and she's with a man now who's not her husband. And a very solid interpretation that we've had for hundreds upon hundreds of years is that she's an immoral woman because she's living with a man who's not her husband. And yes, 2,000 years ago, that was a huge deal in the eyes of the Jewish people. But is that truly what's going on? Because again, we have two facts, five husbands, man she's with is not her husband. It could be a couple other things. And I want us to to, to think about this. I want us to be true to the text. You see, it could be that she's been divorced five times. In that time, women didn't have a right to ask for a divorce. If a husband wanted a divorce, he'd write up a, a certificate because his wife looked differently at him than she should, and he'd present it to the priest, and boom, it's done. If she couldn't have children, specifically sons, he could ask for a divorce. We don't know what's going on, but she's been through five husbands. Maybe she's been passed from husband to husband to husband. We don't know why. And maybe that man she's living with, maybe it's a distant relative who's taken her in to keep her off the streets from either being a prostitute or a beggar. We don't know. Two facts, five husbands, one man she's living with. What about this one? Maybe she's outlived all of her husbands. You know, in that time, the the life expectancy in that time of of a male in Jesus' time was 35 years old. Now, that takes into account a really high infant mortality rate, so it's probably a little bit more than that. But at the end of the day, if she's gone through five husbands as a widow, the grief that she's felt, the darkness she's walked into, and again, maybe that husband or that man she's living with who's not her husband could be a distant relative. We don't know. That first interpretation is a pretty solid interpretation. So I want to gently be walking in this area. No matter what, no matter what is, this woman is in in brokenness. And my point is this, sometimes uh, some things appear to be what they really aren't. And so it happened a few thousand years ago, it happens to this day. That coworker in your office with pep in her step could be totally broken inside with darkness in her heart because of one word, brokenness. That amazing family of five that you see on social media could really be a den of dogs at each other's throat because of one word, brokenness. That person who's near you, who who seems all put together, could be falling apart completely because of one word, brokenness. But here's the beauty about Jesus, is that the love of Jesus is greater than the depth of your brokenness. The height of the love of Jesus is greater than the depth of your brokenness. So let's say she's had five husbands. That's a fact. We know she has. And let's say she's living with somebody right now. And, and, and it's, it's an immoral, sinful issue. No matter what the interpretation, we know she's broken. No matter what the interpretation, Jesus knows her heart. She's always been given a bed, but never rest. She's always been given a husband, but never a heart. She's given her love, but she's probably never received it. She's been given a religion, but never a relationship. She's thirsty to the bottom of her soul. And she's going to the wrong fountains to get that thirst quenched. 
And it begs a question for us, from what fountain are you drinking? From what fountain are you drinking? If you're in a time of brokenness right now, especially in the Christmas season, we see this. If you're in a time of brokenness and darkness, if you're not going to Jesus to quench that thirst, whatever you are going to will never be enough. Only Jesus can light up the darkness. So back to our story. The woman says, sir, I see you're a prophet. So now she's going to go back for round two. She puts on her gloves again, and she's going to take it into a spiritual direction. Skip down to verse 20. She said, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. Okay, remember that, that fourfold creed, one place of worship for the Samaritan Jews was Mount Gerizim. So she's like, she's going to probe Jesus on this. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain and you people, you Judean Jews say that in Jerusalem, Mount Zion is the place where men ought to worship. And I could just see Jesus scratching his head, just going, come on, girl, you don't want to go down this road, but we got to go down this road. Remember in Luke 12, Jesus came to divide and what we can do is we can take that out of context. When he says, I came to divide, he, he said, you, there, there's no middle ground with Jesus. Either you are going to follow Jesus or you don't. There's no middle ground. So in your family, to put it in context, in your family, you say, I'm following Jesus. Mom and dad may say, get out of my house. Jesus is going to unite two groups of people here in our story. He's going to unite Samaritan Jews and Judean Jews under one Messiah. But I'm getting ahead of myself because he's got to set the record straight. Look at verse 22. He says, you worship what you do not know. You Samaritan Jews worship what you do not know. We, the Judean Jews, worship what we know. For salvation is from the Judean Jews. Jesus says, in essence... You guys are off base. You don't know what you're talking about. This whole concept of our fathers worshiped in this mountain, there's going to come a time when you're going to worship in spirit and truth to where it's not the place where you worship that matters, it's the God who you worship who matters. Jesus has to make sure she understands what the real truth is. He does it in kindness and in truth. But again, back to that fourfold creed, one Torah, one book, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. A beautiful thing about the Torah is that, yes, it points to the Messiah, Jesus. But what Jesus is, is basically saying is you can't understand who I am without all these other things, without the Psalms, uh, uh, w- without Isaiah, Zechariah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Joel, Amos. You can't see who I am. I, I'm shown in all of these places. You got it all wrong. I'm the Messiah. You've got to understand you can't do it without me. It's interesting how after Jesus pours out his Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the disciples are on fire and they're preaching Jesus everywhere. And when they go to the synagogue to preach Jesus, what they're doing is they're trying to show the Jewish people not that, hey, we got this new religion called Christianity, come to church. No, what they're doing is they're saying, Jesus completes our religion, Judaism. He's saying you can't understand this without all of these other things. You worship what you do not know. He sets the record straight. Then the conversation continues with a great revelation. Look at verses 25 to 26. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Look at this, look at this, look at this. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Mic drop right there. I who speak to you am he. In the original language, he says, the I am is here. Go with me on this. She knows her Torah. She's sparring with a rabbi. And one book, the Torah, think about Exodus. When God is speaking to Moses and says, I am who I am, she'd connect the dots. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm the I am, but don't miss this either. Jesus doesn't reveal himself as the Messiah To Nicodemus, who he just met with shortly before this, the leader, the teacher of all of Israel. He doesn't reveal himself to the disciples as the Messiah just yet. He does it to a woman, a Samaritan woman, a Samaritan Jewish woman, a Samaritan Jewish broken woman who's in darkness. And it's amazing what he does. And I think, I think he sees in her something that we don't. He sees a warrior. He sees a lioness because she's going to go out on a mission in just a couple minutes. We're going to cover that and it's going to be a tough mission. 
And as I was putting this together, I started thinking about it, how God chooses his toughest warriors for his greatest assignments. It's true, God chooses his toughest warriors for his greatest assignments. In the military, we had a saying and still have a saying, tough times never last, tough people do. If you're going through something right now, just maybe, just maybe, God's saying, I need you to respond to your difficulty with four things, character, honor, integrity, and faith. Because when you do, when you respond in that way, it's going to echo into eternity. You're going to change your corner of the world. You're going to change your corner of your neighborhood. You could change your family. But your response matters because your greatest suffering could end up being your greatest ministry. God chooses his toughest warriors for his greatest assignments. So back to our story. She's going to have an assignment. So here's what happens. The disciples come up, you can read it on your own, and when, when the disciples come up, they aren't going to say to Jesus, what the heck are you doing? But you know they're thinking it. In fact, the text says that, that they're amazed, that they're shocked. Actually, what they do is they look down on her with shame. She's heard it before. She's seen it before. I mean, you think about it. She's, she's getting water alone. She doesn't have any husbands. Uh, the husbands or the guy she's with right now is not her husband. You gar- I guarantee you she's had shame in her life. But she's not going to stand around and listen. She's got the Messiah in her heart now. So what does she do? She drops her jug and she moves out on the assignment. And that assignment is to tell her people about Jesus. When she drops that jug, in essence, she's saying, my past is done. I got a new future. Here I go. That's what she's doing. She's done with the shame. I want to be very clear about something today. And it's this, Jesus will never shame you. He will never shame you. Shame always comes from the enemy. There's a big difference between guilt and shame. When you receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord, he takes up residence inside you as the Holy Spirit. So when you biff it, when you sin, because face it, all of us are going to sin. Every day we sin. But when we sin, the Holy Spirit convicts us and he gives us guilt. That guilt is a good guilt. And so 1 John 1 verse 9 says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's not talking about uh, about salvation. That's a verse about having a healthy relationship with God. So we biff it, we confess it to God, we confess it to someone else. We, We want to change in our hearts. If we can clean up the mess as best we can, make amends, that's awesome. Nonetheless, we stand up, we dust off, and we move forward smartly, getting back into the arena to fight. That's guilt. It's been forgiven. A couple days go by, and you start thinking about what you did, and you feel guilty again. That's shame, and that's from the enemy. The big difference between guilt and shame. You see, because guilt says, I've done something wrong. Shame says, I am wrong to the core. Guilt says, I've done something bad. Shame says, I am bad to the core. Guilt said, I've made, I've made a mistake. Shame says, I am a mistake. Let me be so clear right now. No one here is a mistake. If you're walking on this planet, God put you here for a reason. He formed you in his mother's womb, in your mother's womb, for a reason. He's got a plan for you. He wants you to walk with character, honor, integrity, and faith. You are not a mistake. So if you're feeling some shame right now, maybe it's time to drop the jug and move forward. And that's what this lady does. That's exactly what happens. Skip down to verses 28 through 30. So the woman left her water pot, her jug, and went into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all the things that I've done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and they were coming to him. So she's on an assignment. God chooses his toughest warriors for his greatest assignments. Verses 39 to 42. Skip down to there. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all the things that I've done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them and he stayed there two days. That had to freak out the disciples. What? Can't we just keep on moving on? No rest stop. Come on. 
but they stay two days. Many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we've heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the savior, savior of the world because of what this woman said. You see, in a Samaritan city, a Samaritan Jewish city, it's a very Jewish reason, region of, of Samaria, you'd have elders sitting at the city gates and she'd have to approach the elders, all men, and that would be a very difficult assignment. And they actually listen to her. And then they come and see what Jesus says. It took such incredible, incredible courage to do that. And they listen to her. So no matter what the interpretation, five husbands living with one now, no matter what, she's on an assignment and she's doing things, having Jesus speak into her darkness. And now then she's blessed to be a blessing. And what I want to do, the last few minutes of our teaching today, what I want to do is I want to go down a rabbit trail. As you guys know, I love teaching out of the Old Testament, and there's a reason why. Because there's some, some dots we got to connect here that are going to bring this story to life out of the Old Testament. So let's go down this rabbit trail. Go back to verse 5. It's okay, we'll get through this. Verse 5. So he, Jesus, came to the city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son. Now remember, Jesus always did things on purpose, with a mission. He had a focus. Sychar is in the region of Shechem. Shechem in Hebrew, remember what it means, shoulder. Jesus is going to shoulder her burdens. Shechem is the city of refuge. Jesus is going to become her city of refuge. But wait, there's more. What about this whole Joseph's bones thing? That's kind of weird. Or is it? Go back a few thousand years before this, and you got Abraham, you know, Father Abraham, the, uh, the, the leader of, uh, the, the founder of the Jewish faith, if you will. And Abraham has two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Uh, Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob has 12 sons from which we'd have the 12 tribes of Israel. The second to the youngest son is a guy named Joseph. Jacob loves Joseph more than any of his other, other sons. And one morning when Joseph is a, a teenager, they're sitting around the breakfast table and, and Joseph is not wise. And as a good teenager, just kind of blurts out what's on his heart and says, hey guys, I had a dream last night that you're all going to bow down to me. Funny thing, right? They didn't think it was that funny because he's sitting there in a really cool coat that his dad gave him. So they decide that they're going to take care of this Joseph problem. Uh, they end up uh, betraying him, kidnapping him, selling him into slavery, into Egypt, where Joseph would walk with those four things, character, honor, integrity, and faith. He would go from hardship to hardship to hardship, yet God would bless him. He'd end up being the prime minister of all of Egypt, and he would end up saving his people. That's important. He would bring all of his family there to Egypt to save them from a famine. He would die. Uh, the, 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 the sons of, of Jacob would grow. They'd expand. The Hebrew nation would grow. They'd become very powerful. Pharaohs would die off. New Pharaoh comes in. He enslaves the Jewish people. We know the story after that. 400 years of slavery. Uh, Moses shows up. God says, tell him, let my people go. They, they do the exodus out of Egypt. And guess what they bring with them? Joseph's bones. And when they, they step foot into the promised land, they bury his bones. And where do they bury him? Right here by Jacob's well. It's no coincidence that Jesus chose this spot because just as Joseph saved his people, Jesus was going to use this woman, this Samaritan woman, this Samaritan Jewish woman, the Samaritan Jewish broken woman in darkness to save her people as she would point people to Jesus who truly saves. How cool is that? But wait, there's more. Jesus now is going to unite two groups of people of the Jewish faith, Samaritan Jews who hate one another and Judean Jews who hate one another under one Messiah. It's amazing, but there's more to it. If you fast forward now about six years after this, it, well, let's just go three years after this. 
Go to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 8. If you go three years after this, Jesus goes to the cross, he dies, he's buried, he's resurrected. About 50 days after that, he pours out his Holy Spirit. And, and <clears throat> excuse me, as I said earlier, the disciples are on fire. And they're preaching Jesus all over Jerusalem. And then they start getting persecuted. And when they get persecuted, look where they go. Look at this, Acts chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. Therefore, those who had been, had been scattered and went about preaching the word, uh, Philip went down. Philip's one of the disciples. Philip went down to the city of what? Samaria. Oh, yeah, that's in that whole region of Shechem. You know, you got Gerizim there. You got the well. You got all that stuff. The city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord. We're giving attention to what was said by Philip. This is six years later. As they heard and saw the signs which he was performing, so there was so much rejoicing in that city. Six years after Jesus had this conversation in a place where no Jewish man would ever want to go, the disciples are on fire and they're going to Samaria. What if? What if? Okay, when Bob says this isn't biblical, it's biblical. Okay, this isn't biblical, it's uh, kiplical. Uh, what if? You've got this woman. It's only six years later. You got this woman who six years before met this Jesus of Nazareth. And she came to faith in him. She's walking up to that well. She's got that vase and she looks out of the side of her eye and she sees Mount Gerizim because you can't miss it from where she is. And she starts thinking spirit and truth. Spirit and truth, the place you don't, the, the, the place you worship him won't matter. The God you worship does. And she just smiles because she's heard it before, and now all of her people are hearing it. Speculation, but possible. So why this story at Christmas? You know, too often at Christmas, we get so hyper-focused on the baby in the manger. Great story. A, 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 amazing story. We get so focused on angels we have heard on high that what do we do? We forget the why behind the what, why Jesus came. The Samaritan woman's story is our story. This is why Jesus came. And we can't forget that this Christmas season. So Jesus is the light that expels the darkness as well as your darkness. So uh, four takeaways, four takeaways as I land this plane. We're going to go through this pretty quickly. Four takeaways. Takeaway number one, Jesus expels the darkness of the unseen realm. Jesus expels the darkness of the unseen realm. Think about this. In the Old Testament, we don't see possession of demons in people. We really don't. I, I can't recall where there is one. If there is, uh, uh, you, you don't see it a whole lot for sure. Jesus is born... He, 30 years later, steps on the scene, he's doing his ministry, and he's casting demons out right and left. He, he casts out thousands of demons. Think about this. Jesus begins his earthly ministry. He's uh, baptized in the Jordan River, comes up out of the water. The Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove and leads him, the Holy Spirit leads him out to the desert to throw down with Satan. And he defeats Satan by quoting scripture as Satan misquotes it. Jesus is saying, I'm declaring war on the unseen realm, the principalities of darkness. And guess what? When he goes to the cross, he's won the war. And what's so beautiful is when he returns at some time, all evil will be done. It's amazing. He expels the darkness of the unseen realm, thing one. Thing two, Jesus came to cross barriers. Jesus came to cross barriers. We talked about those four barriers, you know, the, the racial, moral, gender, and religious, but what about a fifth barrier? That barrier called sin. Because, face it, none of us can be good enough to stand in front of a holy God. We can act great all day, but at the end of the day, uh, it, 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 we can't be good enough to stand in God, in front of God. So God crushes his son, Jesus. He steps down from his throne into a major manger, Born in a manger, not a palace. Born of peasantry, not of royalty. And 33 years later, he's crushed on the cross for our sins. And we receive him in, in our heart as he's resurrected. And now then we can approach a holy God. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And with Jesus, he's that bridge that allows us to cross that barrier. How amazing is that? Number three. Jesus came to expel division. 
He came to expel division. I want to speak to the Christ followers here and attending online. If you go to John chapter 17, Jesus, before he's arrested and then headed off to the cross to be crushed, he prays this high priestly prayer, which is all about unity. He prays for his disciples. He prays for future disciples. He prays for us, the church. What if this week was a week, if you've got a conflict with a Christian brother or sister, that you say, you know what, instead of playing tug of, tug of war, we're just going to set down the rope. We're going to agree on the main things of the gospel, and we're going to be united. That would be pretty powerful. Last but not least, Jesus came to expel your darkness. Jesus came to expel your darkness and my darkness. I don't know about you guys, but so often I have this dark place in my heart. I don't want God to go there. I, I don't want Jesus to step foot in there. I've got like this, it, it, it's like a lock on it. I don't want him in there. I don't want him to see those things that I think about or things that I want to do or I've done. But he's like, no, I need to shine that light. What if this week you simply took time to sit by that proverbial Jacob's well and he just said, you know what? Jesus, I need, to sh you need you to shine that light into my heart. And then I want to stand up and I'm gonna, uh, I want to be a blessing because you have blessed me. You see, the people who walk in darkness see a great light. And those who live in a dark land, that light, that light's going to shine on them. That light was born in a manger a couple thousand years ago. And what he does now is he calls on us to love well, to be that light in a pretty dark world. Will you do that?